Hello, what a beautiful piece. I feel the reverie. My name's Liza Ashbrook. I'm a sleep neurologist and researcher at UCSF. I'm so excited to be here today talking to you about sleep. I spend many of my days seeing patients with sleep disorders. I hear from them, I know from my own experience, as I'm sure you do too, how important sleep is. From how you feel in the morning when you wake up after going to bed too late, to how you may feel that afternoon with your eyelids drooping in front of your computer screen. We all feel the importance of sleep in our everyday lives. Despite this, we still don't fully understand why we sleep. We know it's important for learning and memory. We know it's important for forgetting things that you don't need to remember, like what you had for dinner last week. It's important for emotional regulation. It's also important for cleansing the brain. Our brains are very active in the daytime, and we create race products. And we have a system at night called the glymphatic system that helps clear these waste products as we sleep, during our deepest sleep. Some of these waste products include the misfolded proteins tau and amyloid that can lead to Alzheimer's disease, and Elpis nuclein that can lead to Parkinson's. It's likely that sleep is an undertapped resource for preventing these serious illnesses. One of the ways we evaluate sleep is an EEG. It stands for electroencephalogram. You can see these squiggles of red on the right represent different stages. So an EEG is glued to the head and picks up electrical activity. Stage one sleep, that third line down, represents a slowing, but stage one is a transitory state. It was represented in the music you walked into today. We only spend about 5% of our night in stage one sleep. If there's a loud noise or someone even whispers your name or closes the door, you're likely to awaken from stage one, and you may have felt that you weren't even sleeping. From there, we move to stage two sleep. We spend about half our night in stage two. Some of the features that represent stage two on the EEG include a sleep spindle, this very fast period. That's important for learning and memory. And then the K complex is this very large amplitude wave, important for memory, also for gating the brain. Loud noises in the environment can actually provoke a K complex, and it may be that they help you stay asleep in a loud, noisy environment. And then there's delta sleep, also called stage three or N3 sleep. This is our deepest sleep. If you awaken from stage three sleep, you feel very groggy. You can see that the waves during delta sleep are large amplitudes, slow. This represents that the brain, the neurons, are firing very synchronously. This is probably when the glymphatic clearance happens and provides the restorative properties of sleep. And then there's REM sleep. REM was first described as recently as the 1950s, following the first continuous EEG recording overnight. At first, people didn't actually believe that the brain could look so active when the body looked so passive. And you can see that in REM sleep, that red squiggle at the bottom there is more similar to stage one or wake than it is to delta sleep. We now know that REM is our vivid dream sleep. If you waken during REM, you can really cite a lot of details of your dream. We also know that regulation of breathing and heart rate changes. We have rapid eye movements. That's how it got its name, REM sleep. We also know that the creativity associated with sleep is probably related to REM sleep. Our bodies are paralyzed during REM, probably so we can't act out our dreams. We cycle through these different stages throughout the night. This is an idealized version of what happens. It's messier than this, but we do follow a clear progression throughout the night with the different stages. It takes about an hour and a half or so to get to your first REM stage, and there's more REM in the latter part of the night, and more stage three, deep sleep in the first part of the night. So when I see patients in my sleep clinic, I can gather a lot of information about what's wrong just by hearing what's concerning them and when they sleep in the 24-hour day. But sometimes we need to gather more information. We can do a home sleep test where we collect information on oxygen and breathing patterns, and that's really good to diagnose sleep apnea, which is a problem where the airway collapses repeatedly overnight and is very common. And you can see me on the right there. I'm a sleep fellow about to do an overnight polysomnogram and there's wires head to toe. I don't even have on the nasal cannula yet. So this is also something we use to evaluate sleep. A couple of recent patients of mine who got sleep studies include Mr. H. He's a 63-year-old man who I saw in clinic a few weeks ago. He complained that a few months prior, he'd had some really concerning behaviors in his sleep. 
He woke one night and he'd been dreaming he was fighting. He'd actually punched the desk next to him and hurt his knuckles. He was concerned, but he was otherwise healthy. He didn't seek out help immediately. Then a few weeks later, he awoke. He dreamt he was fighting monsters and he was holding a pillow, having swiped everything off the desk next to him. He was really concerned he was gonna further hurt himself or hurt his bed partner. I was also concerned and I had him come in for a sleep study. This is a 30 second clip of a sleep study and I'll draw your attention to the red and purple lines here. These are the arm leads. They represent muscle activity in the arms. So they should be flat. He's in REM during this epic. Instead, they're really elevated. He was holding his arms up conducting as if in front of a symphony. This supported a diagnosis of REM sleep behavior disorder. In this disorder, neurons in the back of the brain, the pons, which are supposed to lead to the paralysis of REM, aren't functioning properly. One reason this can occur is because of the deposition of alpha-synuclein, which is the protein that leads to Parkinson's. So this disorder can represent a window into what's going on in the brain and things that may happen years in the future via sleep. Another recent patient was Ms. S. She was a 21-year-old woman. She came into clinic complaining of sleepiness. She reported that starting in eighth grade, she began dozing off in her classes. She made it through high school, able to keep up with her coursework, but now is in college and was falling behind. She stopped driving because she was concerned about safety. She also reported that when she awoke in the morning, sometimes her brain would awaken, but her body would still feel paralyzed for a few moments. Sometimes she even saw images from her dream standing in the room with her. When she was awake and laughing, sometimes her knees would buckle and she'd fall down. I had her come in for a night in the sleep lab, but not only that, it was followed by a daytime nap test called the multiple sleep latency test. In this test, we asked her to every two hours lay down and see if she could fall asleep. And we gave her 15 minutes to sleep and looked, does she go into REM sleep or not? So on average, across the four nap opportunities, she fell asleep in four minutes. That's really short. She went into REM twice. If you recall, it typically takes us an hour and a half to go into REM overnight. So going into REM on two naps is abnormal. This supported a diagnosis for Ms. S of narcolepsy with cataplexy. In this disorder, neurons that create a neuropeptide called orexin aren't functioning properly. And orexin stabilizes sleep versus wake and promotes wake. Without it, Ms. S was very sleepy and her REM was very dysfunctional, intruding into naps. Flipping from REM to wake also wasn't going perfectly and the body was having pieces of REM, the paralysis and even the vivid dreams persist into her waking period called sleep paralysis and hypnopompic hallucinations. Parts of REM, the paralysis, were even intruding into wake when she felt her knees buckle and nearly fall down with laughing. That's called cataplexy, pieces of REM intruding into wake. By diagnosing her with narcolepsy with cataplexy, we were able to get her onto the right treatment and she can now drive again. These two disorders, REM sleep behavior disorder and narcolepsy with cataplexy, we have an understanding of the pathophysiology. And yet there's a lot about sleep that we still have to learn. We don't know exactly why some people get by with only six hours of sleep, whereas others need nine to feel refreshed. Some people are early birds, other night owls. There's a lot more to learn about sleep, and I'm hoping that research we do over time will be able to help me prescribe the right time for you to go to bed and wake up, and the right duration to have your best night of sleep and have your best day. Thank you so much.